Today's guest presenter was a renowned local storyteller called Shanaki. He was of medium height and strongly built, with his wild red hair pulled into a ponytail that flowed down his back. Leaning comfortably against one of the hazel trees, the man looked to Sarah as if he had grown out of the forest. Dressed as he was in an olive green shirt and khaki pants, he might have completely blended into his surroundings had his brilliant blue eyes not flashed as he spoke. He was obviously ready to begin his talk, so Sarah and the others quickly found places to sit or stand near the wall of a ruined chapel that hugged a moss-covered overhang at the back of the grove. The storyteller had been invited to recount the history of the mysterious men and women who once had used groves such as this for their rituals and healing practices and to instruct their students. He began with a bit of Gaelic. We call them Dria in Old Irish, Dri for a man and Bandri for a woman. I use the old terms so you can hear the sound of the language that carries their essence. Explaining no more, the Shanachie began to beat his barren drum as he repeated an ancient chant known as Amargine's Hymn. Pa-pa-da-da-pum, pa-pa-da-da-pum, the, the rhythm went, sending tingles of energy up the listeners' spines until all felt their bodies merge with the beat as if they themselves were the storyteller's drum. I am a wind within the sea. I am a sea wave on the land. I am the sound of the deep sea. I am a stag of seven tines. I am a hawk on the high cliff. I am a teardrop of the sun. I am a turning in a maze. I am a boar of great valor. I am a salmon in a pool. I am a lake on a fair plain. I am the excellence of art. Who but I knows mountain stones? Who but I calls ages moon? Who but I knows what lies west? As the Shanki continued intoning line upon line, the sound of his drum and voice bathed the grove and swirled around the group, growing stronger and stronger until they felt the tug of the invisible world that Amargine's words invoked. The chant complete, its purpose achieved, the Shanachie spun out his tales of the wise ones who had frequented this place. No one knows for certain where the Dria came from, though their origin is older than most will say. Some claim they were Egyptian priests or Persian magi, perhaps astrologers from Babylon or students of the ancient Greek Pythagoras. Sarah sensed the truth in every word the Shanachie spoke. When he sp said the Druid came from Egypt, she felt a moment of intense clarity, and the grove's atmosphere went all shimmery before her eyes. He's telling my soul's story, she heard her truest self declare. Later, her mind would recall only snippets of the Shanachie's stories. Her heart remembered every word. The afternoon shadows lengthened and the lowering sun began to transform a few thin clouds into fingers of radiant purple, ruby, and gold. Mindful of the time, the Shanaki concluded his talk. Remember, friends, he said, with sparkling eyes and a sly smile, the Drea placed great importance upon dreams. Perhaps one night your slumber will be graced by a visitation from the ancients. Gazing out at his audience, the Shanaki scanned the gathering as if he were looking for someone. When his intense blue eyes met Sarah's, a flash of recognition shot between them like a tiny bolt of blue lightning. The power of that connection almost knocked her down. The man smiled and briefly continued looking out at the others. Then he gave a slight bow to his enchanted listeners and walked briskly off into the trees. Those who sat where they could watch him go swore later they had seen what looked like fireflies flickering in his wake. Though none could be sure, he had disappeared so quickly. The travelers were unusually quiet as they made their way back to their lodgings and a welcome meal. Sarah joined them for a family-style dinner of poached salmon, cold lentil salad, and boiled potatoes, but she hardly noticed the abundance of the spread. 
she was still feeling the impact of her experience in the grove. On other evenings, the generous meal that had been carefully prepared by local cooks would have earned her full attention. Tonight, she could hardly eat. I'm exhausted. I need to go to bed, she explained to her new friends. Several nodded. They, too, were still caught up in the numinous atmosphere the Shanachie had created. Good night, they called after her. Sleep well. Once Sarah was back in the cozy piece of her private room, she stretched her arms over her head. What should she be doing? She felt the Shanachie stories beckoning, though to what end she could not say. Deciding the time was actually too early for sleep, Sarah kicked off her shoes and sat on her bed. Throwing a homey comforter over her feet, she fluffed up her pillows and leaned back to reflect on the day's events. I should record what I felt in the grove, she said out loud. But the minute she took up her journal, she could not pen a word. She could not even remove her clothes. Instead, she curled up in the comforter and sank into her bed's downy softness. As slumber began to overtake her, Sarah felt and then heard the full-bodied purring of her panther guide. Enveloped by the animal's vibrant murmur, she slipped into a dream that in days to come, she would realize had been a visitation, as the Shanke had foretold. The scenes she was about to witness would extend far beyond her imagination into worlds of mystery and wonder.